You're listening to AM 1000 WCCD Radio, programming for the soul of the city. It's time now for Summer Nights, right here on WCCD. For the next two hours, we will take you inside of the heart of ministries and churches that are making an impact on the city of Cleveland. And now, with this week's featured ministry, here is the host of Summer Nights, right here on AM 1000, Ricardo Johnson. Thank you, Eric, and welcome to Summer Nights again here on WCCD, the soul of the city, this June 9th. Uh, we're glad to have you listening in. We hope that you continue to listen in the rest of the week. We have some interesting words to come to you with through the Greek and the Hebrew. We want you to get your Bibles, get your concordances, and whatever else you use to study the Bible, and study the Word of God with us. And also give us a call at one 281 1110 That's one 281 1110 Now let's go to Mike from Grace Cafe. You are inside Grace Cafe. Get your Bible. Open it up and keep an open eye and an open ear and celebrate with us Paul's evangel of grace, God's amazing grace. Are you ready? It's coming. Ready or not, change is coming. Can you feel the spirit rising in you? Has it been a while since you felt the fire? Cafe. We are here because we want to share with you some good news about Paul's evangel. So we hope that you'll stay with us. We hope that you'll listen and call in with your questions and comments. I think we're going to open the phone lines right from the get-go here. Why don't we do that? No reason to. No reason to to wait. Right. The Denise? phone number. The phone number to call is one triple eight two eight one eleven ten. That is one triple eight two eight one eleven ten. You're getting good at that. Yeah, I, I went to college for that. Well, that's good. Was that a four-year <laughs> college or a technical school? It, it, well, you know, it was a college. Uh, you did very well, and uh, I, wait, I that's a toll. Were... That is a that is a toll. That is a toll-free call. Right, all, all over around the world. the world, all over the world, all around the world. Hey, I'm tossing around the idea though of um, giving a T-shirt for the uh, the the questioner, the person that calls in with a startling revelation of truth. Something that stumps these Bible teachers, they're going to win a t-shirt that says, I waxed bold on Grace Radio. This is like, this is like Cedar Point, it's right? A it's a badge it's of like honor. A, <laughs> you have to, it's like one of, the, one of the midway games at Cedar Point. Stump the Bible teachers. <laughs> who, who determines whether they stump us or not? Yeah. Well, I guess the guy that uh, talks last wins. <laughs> oh, oh, that's that's easy. Thank you. <laughs> we do control the buttons here, don't we? Yeah. Um, I'm kidding. Thank I'm goodness. Kidding. <laughs> but we would like to welcome everybody to our uh, our casual and formal Bible study. Right now, around the table, we have just about every version on the planet. Our Strong's Concordances, our Young's Literal. Um, we uh, use our notebooks. We study the Word of God. We dig to look for uh, the real meanings in the Greek and the Hebrew. And wow, do you find out some amazing things when you get, uh, you tear apart the word and you really get back to the original languages. It's pretty cool. You know, Paul told Timothy to be an unashamed workman. And it, it does take work. People are upset when we, you know, a lot of people are upset to find out that God didn't uh, speak English or that Jesus didn't speak English and that there's some things in the Greek we need to look at. Uh, People are upset, uh, you know, they don't want to work that hard. But with any other occupation on the earth, you have to work. Like, you had to go to college in order to recite that number, right? <laughs> one eight eight eight. that's a hard thing. You had to work for that. If you want to be a plumber, you go to plumber school. 
If you want to be a doctor, you got to go to college for 8, 12 years to be a doctor. To fly a jetliner, you have to be trained and go to school, yet people think that uh, you can just wander up to the scriptures, grab, pick, and choose whatever you want out of there, mix it all up, and uh, God's going to honor that work. Well, that's not necessarily the case. That's why Paul told Timothy we need to be unashamed workmen and uh, rightly dividing the word of truth. He also says, with a pattern of sound words. Yes, a pattern of that, sound. That tipped people off right from the get-go. Well, words are important. And uh, if we don't get into this tonight, we'll get into it tomorrow night. Uh, we're going to be looking at some a very important word uh, in the Scripture. We certainly hope, folks, that you're having as much fun as we do doing these studies. Uh, the, that's what this is all about, uh, to rejoice, to have fun in yes, God's Word, and there's so much there to bring the joy, and uh, ju just make our hearts so glad that it, it shows forth in our lives, um, but uh, th that's what our our prayer and our, our desire is for you, is uh, His, as Paul says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. i got to get that in. Right. That, that is so good, but it, it all brings joy. All brings joy. We want to take everybody back to the cross for everything we do. We want to lift up the name of Jesus, and um, we seek to do that with every fiber of our being. Whatever our, whatever the Lord wants of us, He has. Vessels of clay. Yeah, we take them back to the cross, but yet the, the power, the work of the cross, so much of it is in the future to, for us to see to realize, for it to come into our experience, the work that was done on the cross, there's a lot of it still to be realized. Mm -hmm. As Mike says, or as the song says, our theme song, there is so much more. Mm -hmm. and, and with that for me, let's let's move on to Ted here. He's with us again tonight. Uh, we a missed scholar you last in his night. own right. We really, yes, definitely. We, we really missed you last night, Ted. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't be here last night. Uh, I had another commitment, but uh, I'm looking forward to tonight. And I just want to make sure everybody knows that, uh, you know, we're all learning here, and, and we each have our, our Bibles out. We're, we're taking notes at the same time, and, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a blessing just to get together with one another here, whether we're on the air or just one another in this room. And, and so uh, this is a highlight of our, our, our days, uh, our weeks, so... Uh, it's good to be here. In fact, it's hard for us to leave this room after the broadcast. We go off the air at nine o'clock, and we're probably in. We're in here for another <laughs> hour, and uh, the the uh, the Bible study goes on, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ricardo is uh, issuing an eviction notice tonight. <laughs> Luckily, they're not uh, they're not charging us more for that time too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean we're not paying rent. Don't give them any ideas. <clears throat> Way to go, well, Charlie. We can pay them out of the. Jar oh yeah, we, we got that, that <laughs> jar for the, the snorters, snort the snort jar. Don't bring it gonna, up. No, 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 no. Uh oh, is Ricardo rolling his eyes over there no, now? No. Oh gee. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Ken here. Ken, say hello. Hi out there. Uh, it's good to be here with uh, friends again, and uh, we're looking forward to teaching the Word of God to all those out there listening tonight and in hopes that something will penetrate their hearts and their minds, that they may learn what Christ has done for them Amen. in their life. Mm -hmm. And we're just thankful to be here. Uh, it is through God's grace that we're here. Uh, we desire for all those who are listening to know the depths and the richness of what Christ has accomplished for all of us. Back to you there. Back to me. Well that, said. That was good when he said, back to you. That's a, that's a good radio phrase. We do also want to rem remind everyone that he has a tape series available. Uh, a couple of them, actually. You can write to Grace Cafe at P.O. Box 33345, and we can send you a list of what is available, and you will be blessed. We had the tapes we offered uh, last week, oh. which was Beyond Politics. And uh, we have talked some on the sovereignty of God, haven't we? Mm -hmm. So there, I do have an eight-tape series called the Sovereignty Series. And gets into the question of free will. And just as one verse after another, as you can tell in Grace Cafe, we're heavy on the verses. We try to let the Word of God. It's our desire to let the Word of God speak. 
and uh, that's what I try to do on these tapes. So uh, I don't charge for these tapes. It's true, I've never turned down a contribution if you like them, but the right to Grace Cafe, and I'll be happy to get those to you. He's also got a series called the Sin Series, and if you are struggling in your life with your your sin, your failure, your flesh, it, your flesh. If you're struggling, I really suggest that you get this tape series. There, there is a message that it has blessed a lot of people. God has used this, and it has helped a lot of people. There's a lot of condemnation going on, <clears throat> where we're feeling guilty about sins that the God is not uh, reckoning to us, and none of us are going to stop sinning this side of immortality. It's just not going to happen. And when we expect it to happen, um, we, we, we begin to pay more attention to what we're doing in the flesh, to how we're behaving, than we do to minding things above, which is, is Christ. And uh, yeah, feel free to write for that. You know, in the weeks to come, when we're on the air here, we might be talking about some of those things. Relieve uh, the believers of guilt. We have a caller. Right, Hi. Off, right off the bat. Hi, Amber. This is Amber in Cleveland. What's your question? How many times has the Bible been rewritten? You think it's been rewritten? Well, mm -hmm. Amber, how, how old are you? Ten. That is great. You're, you're ten years old and uh, you're thinking about the things of God, aren't you? Yes. That is great. Your, your mom and dad are, are probably believers, huh? Mm-hmm. That, that is great. I'm, I'm glad you called. Actually, um... God wrote the Bible one time, and uh, He inspired uh, many different men to uh, write the Scriptures. And uh, so really, no one can actually rewrite the Bible. But what we have in the Christian bookstores, you notice there's, probably, there's a lot of different translations. Um, a lot of different men have uh, looked at what God wrote, and they've made new, tran new translations according to their interpretations of some of the words. Does that make any... Am I making any sense? Yes. Okay, see, God, it was written one time. One time. And, and you know what? Mm -hmm. I wish we had the original manuscript. Wouldn't that be exciting to have the very piece of paper that Paul wrote on. Wouldn't that be great? I'm hoping that the originals will turn up in a, a garage sale up in Schenectady, New York or something someday. But we don't have the originals. We don't have the original. You know, have you ever been to a Washington, D.C.? No. All right. Well, we got there's some great documents there, like the Declaration of Independence. And that's the same exact document that uh, Benjamin Franklin and those guys signed. But unfortunately, we don't have that. Uh, we don't have the originals. But a lot of men have labored with some old, old manuscripts. Which are copies of those Which originals. are actually copies of the, of the originals. And uh, see, that's why we're real concerned about going back to the original language, is because uh, when people try to put the Bible into English, sometimes things get lost in the translation. Have you ever heard that phrase? No. Well, you've heard it tonight for the first time on Grace Cafe, lost in the translation. So we really are interested to know what God wrote. And again, he only wrote it one time. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. Oh, go ahead. Hey, wait, 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 Mike has something to say to him. Do you have a translation there? Hmm? Are you, do you have a Bible there that you're looking at as, as you listen to us? Yeah, I have two of them. Which ones do you have? King James Version. Okay. And... New International Version. The NIV. Okay. Oh, good. We are happy that you're following along. Amber, thanks for the call. And Amber, one thing. How do you, you've been listening, is this your first time or have you listened before? My first time. Okay. Well, uh, keep listening. We would like to know, how, you, how do you like our music? Okay. Okay. <laughs> we, we hope it gets to you. Okay, yeah. Amber. God bless you, honey. Thank you. Thanks for calling, Amber. <clears throat> Okay. That was that was good. That is a good question. I I mean lot, many people don't realize uh you know they they don't think very far back into this that uh God wrote it once. That's all he needed to write it. Right. Right. And you know and it does confuse people. Well, how do we know what he said? There's so many translations and there's some 
there's actually uh, some Bibles that have, what, five or six translations. Each verse, you can read it in so many different uh, translations. And a lot of, there's a lot of confusion. Well, this translation says that. Which one is, is right? That's where the concordance comes in. And Amber's not on the line anymore, but if you're listening, Amber, and anyone else, um, a concordance is a record of every word that God used in the Bible. And uh, by looking at a concordance, we can trace through the translations. We can look, it makes the translation transparent. We can look through to the original word and find out if the translating was done consistently. Isn't that the key? Right. Consistency Consistent. is very important. Uh, should we bring in anything about the difference between a translation and a version here? There's a big difference there, folks. The, the, between true translations, which went back to those ancient manuscripts, there's really not, not that much difference. But in versions, which are which take translations and bring them over into really readable English, uh, that's when we get into trouble. That's when men tend to bring in their interpretation, especially paraphrases. You take a paraphrase like the Living. Bible. I don't recommend uh, anyone read the Living Bible because it's so paraphrased. I, I, I think you know. I think that uh, literal truth sometimes isn't pretty to read. I use the concordant literal New Testament, and there's some hard words in there, but it's taking God's words word for word for word, and that doesn't always sound pretty to the ear. But to me, truth is more beautiful than flowery language. So I'm all for literal translations. People say, well, it's hard to read. I, I, I can't understand it. Take me back to the Living Bible where they're, you know, but again, they're paraphrasing, and as Charlie says, they're, they're throwing in their uh, interpretations, and it's very loose, and by the time you're done with it, you don't, you're not really sure if that's what God said. And usually it's not. Of course, of course even the CLNT, that, that's not a literal translation. The, the concordant literal version. New yeah, that's a, that's a version, too. Because uh, there's such a thing as idiomatic in language, and that's that's bringing things over. Okay, Charlie, ready? The audience is now doing this. What? Why? <laughs> Why would they be? They're oh. so exciting. <laughs> yes. I mean, okay. you're not. You tell me not everybody's interested in this in translation. <laughs> is that why your eyes were drooping? Uh, no, <laughs> no, I don't. I just like to get into the truth. I don't like to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Well, we we are going to are going to do that right now. Uh, in fact, what we're going to do it in a minute. We got a break coming up, but um, before we do, I got to mention the Willard conference. Okay. Okay, cuz we're going to really hit it at 7:30. Uh, batten down your stained glass hatches, folks. Cuz we're going to hit it at 7:30. Put your seatbelts on if you have them. And you'll be very happy for this uh, gradual introduction here from 7 to 7:30 when you hear what's coming up next. Willard Conference this weekend, Willard, Ohio, on US 224, 70 miles west of Akron. Drive up to the nearest service station, ask them where the depot is. We're going to be there. I'm going to be teaching there, so is uh, Ted McDivitt. We'd be happy to meet you. Yeah, you can come on out. It's going to be a lot of fun, and you're going to learn a lot. It's family friendly. We'll be back in just a few minutes. More fun than me. Thanks for listening to Summer Nights. We'll continue in about three minutes, so stay right with us with Grace Cafe, okay? nights on WCCD, the soul of the city. Glad to have you listening in with Grace Cafe. So let's go right to him right now and Denise. Welcome back. We're so glad you're here. It's going to be another tough night. I call this the sweaty Bible study <laughs> because you will have little beads of sweat on you by the time nine o'clock rolls around. So will we. <laughs> Yeah, if I don't start talking. Uh, Ken <laughs> brought up something at the end of yesterday's show that I think we need to jump right back on. Um, we were talking about eternal torment and how that is not a scriptural doctrine. We were looking at some verses that disproved it, and we know there's a lot of verses that seem 
to prove it. And I think it's going to be helpful to jump on something Ken said. We ended last night's show talking about Joseph. And that he was and is widely recognized as a type of Christ. And um, we know who are the bad guys of the Joseph account. His brothers. His brothers, correct. They were, they were terrible fiends. They threw their brother into the, the pit because they were jealous of his dreams of glory. Uh, they convinced their father he was dead, eaten, eaten alive by a wild beast. They sold him for um, 30 pieces of silver. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, where have you heard that before? Yeah, that's no coincidence. They, and, they uh, were good sinners. They were good sinners. Oh, they were good. This is the Israel of God. You know, that, that's the amazing thing, is this is these are Israelites who are doing this uh, terrible sin. And yet, um, Joseph was a type of Christ. He went to Egypt as a slave. He became great in the house of Potiphar. You can find this. Uh, I'm not going to go there, but you can find it in the book of Genesis, beginning with what chapter? Can somebody help me there? 37. Thank you. Uh, beginning with chapter 37. And it um, turns out Joseph becomes a great man. Uh, he goes to jail. I mean, this doesn't happen overnight. Uh, his, his dreams of glory, that's for sure. God gives him these dreams, and then he immediately he's a slave. So I think Joseph held the expectation. He held the expectation of, of those dreams, and yet God took him through the trial. You know, there's an object lesson for us, too, mm -hmm. really. God gives us this great vision of what he's going to do in Christ, that we're going to be uh, seated at the right hand of God someday. And uh, such high blessings we have. And where do we find ourselves? In a traffic jam out on 77. Where do we find ourselves? We find ourselves uh, vessels of clay. And yet, uh, here's a great type. Just uh, yeah. along the way, it's good to bring, bring this out that um, this is the way God works. He gives you the vision of glory, and then, boom, down you go into the pit. Out you go to Egypt, and you become a, a, a slave. Yet Joseph held fast to the expectation. But uh, what a wild story. I mean, you could not invent a wilder story. I mean, s certainly, uh, truth is stranger than fiction with a story of Joseph. I hear a movie in the making. There's a movie there, Joseph. Yeah, go to rent it at your rent that video. They got it out on Joseph's life. Well, for the young people, may be familiar with the play uh, Joseph's Amazing Technicolor Dream Coat. That's been playing around all over the place. Right. That's that playing right now. That's that goes way back. I remember when I was in school. That's what the story of Joseph is based upon. Chapters 37 to 50 in the book of Genesis. <laughs> that you didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they did take some liberties with that particular play. We're not going to take any liberties here. No. Don't they always though. Joseph ends up being a great man, and of course we, we know that he's given wisdom to interpret Pharaoh's dreams concerning a, a, a terrible famine that is uh, coming on the land. Joseph ends up being a savior. He, he brings, during the seven years of, uh, of good, he uh, stores up grain in preparation for the seven years of famine. And lo and behold, here come his brothers seeking food. And they come to Egypt because Egypt is the only nation that has food because of the wisdom of Joseph. And uh, they come up and Joseph ends up giving them food. He blesses them. But he doesn't... Um, exactly roll out the red carpet right away, does he? He vexes them along the way. He gives them many trials before he gives them everything. You know, he eventually invites them back. But before that, he gives them trials. He sends the cup. Remember, he plants his cup in a bag of grain. He makes them bring, he makes them bring Benjamin back. And uh, the, the point of the story, what we're driving at, is that he eventually blesses his enemies. And as a type of Christ, Christ is going to bless his enemies also. What doesn't happen with the story of Joseph? Now, if this is a type of how Christ deals with sinners, of how Joseph deals with his brothers, if this is a type of that, we would expect to see Joseph eternally tormenting his brothers. We would expect to see that. But we don't. He ends up blessing them. Well, the story in chapter 45, uh, 
and the King James Version says, Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him, and he cried, um, Cause every man to get go out from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his, his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said, unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that he, ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. God sent me before you to preserve life. That is so good. He is the forerunner. Joseph was the forerunner to bring the rest in. And this is what we talked about last night. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 10, we read that it was God who is the Savior of all mankind, especially of believers, but not exclusively of believers. That especially there is something we need to look at. Compare it with Joseph now. He was the Savior of all Israel, but especially the Savior of Joseph. See, Joseph went ahead, and he had blessings in Egypt for many years before his brothers came in. You see what, what we're getting at? He was the first, and yet he had other others to, to bring in. But it doesn't happen without trial. His brothers did not uh, come into the blessings of Egypt without trial, but they eventually did come. And this is a picture of what God is going to do, not just with Israel, but with all mankind. Since we're in 1 Timothy, go to chapter 2, verse 6. We read about a man, Christ Jesus, who is giving himself a correspondent ransom for all. The testimony in its own eras. See, it doesn't happen all at once. And we see this with the story of Joseph. He was a ransom for his brothers. And again, I believe we're looking at a type here of Christ and mankind. He's a ransom for his brothers, but it happens in its own eras. For Joseph, it happened earlier. <clears throat> for the rest, they came later. Let's go now to 1 Corinthians 15, 22. We have the same thought here. For since, in fact, let's start with verse 21, I'm in 1 Corinthians 15. Since, in fact, through a man came death, through a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. Yet, each in his own class. And I think the King James says their order. Mm -hmm. Each in their own order. What does your version say, Denise? You got the NASB? Yeah, each in his own order. Each in his own order. So we see the picture. And... Again, if uh, this is consistent with what we're taught about Christ, then Joseph should have tormented his brothers. But instead, he blesses them. That's what I'm getting at. He's a type of Christ. When we look at Joseph and what he does, we can see Christ and what he does. See, there is judgment here. Yes, there is judgment. His brothers end up weeping at his feet, don't they? They're scared. They, they, they're pained because they're, they're afraid of Joseph at first. You look in chapter 50. And yet, and yet Joseph says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And don't you think Jesus Christ is going to say that? And in fact, he did say it to those who put him on the cross. You know, your, your thought of Joseph being sent before, ahead of the others. Uh, and bringing that back to Christ makes me think of First Peter one twenty, which I know we talked about before here some, but verily uh, in the King James, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you. He was foreknown. He was he he, he was prop he was going to come before, even before the sin. Yeah, I mean, most Christians know that. They'll they'll say, "Yeah, we understand that." Yeah. What that what that he was going to come before yeah. the sin. I think anybody that's a serious Bible student knows that he, this was from before the foundation of the world. But look at the implications of that. 
What are the implications of that, that he was foreknown before the foundation of the world? The implications are mm. profound. Huge. Namely, that, uh, s that uh, the cure came before the disease. Right. The cure came before the disease. Let that sink in a minute. That's enough. That's not the way we're taught. No, that's not the way we're taught. We're taught that uh, sin came, and uh, God had to rummage, rummage through His uh, med kit to come up with a cure, uh, come up with a cure for the sin. But the truth of the matter is, and this is radical, but listen closely: God had salvation in His heart, just like He gave Joseph that vision beforehand. See, he gets it beforehand, the glory. The glory comes beforehand. Then you plunge down into the pit. Now, God had salvation in his, in his bosom, in his mind, before anything else. He was always love. He was always a, um, a loving, righteous, good God. But he cannot reveal those characteristics without a foil. He needs antagonism in order to show that. So sin comes and evil comes as a foil, as a backdrop for God to reveal his saving properties. His, his, his sa properties. I didn't mean to say that. His saving ways. His, his saving heart. Mm -hmm. See, and it's all turned around. Our beliefs, what we believe is all backwards. We see God, again, scrambling to fix this thing that happened in the Garden of Eden. It's like God's throwing his papers around. Oh my goodness, what happened? Now i got to send a Savior. But no, the Savior came first. And sin came in order to reveal the Savior. See? See? It, it's, it's not, not the cure. Mm. Jesus Christ is not a cure. He's not a cure. He is the reason that sin had to come because no one would recognize him unless they were sinners. Another parallel with uh, Joseph and, and Christ is in John 17, verse 24 and 25. There it reads that uh, thou lovest, lovest me before the foundation of the world. Where are you at? Uh, John 17, 24 and 25. I'll start with verse 24. Father, those whom thou hast given me, I will that where I am they also may be with me, that they may be beholding my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. We have the love of Jacob with his son Joseph too before all of this occurred. Mm, Here we yeah. have the love of God for His Son there, the Father and the Son, before all the evil took place, before the suffering took place. Mm. Just as you're saying uh, with Peter that uh, the suffering was foreknown. Mm -hmm. Okay, so was the Father's love for His Son. Mm -hmm. And that's what made the brother. That was, that was some of the reason why the brothers were... Uh, envious or jealous, jealous of Joseph, but there's the father's love before him. Right, you know, in uh, in chapter 45, verse 13, Ted, uh, it also states here that Joseph's speaking to his brothers, and he's telling them, "Now you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you must hurry and bring my father down here." Here it shows the love and, and the splendor, the same splendor in which Christ also enjoyed with his Father, you see. Right. That's a good point, Ken. And then, then one thing I'd just like to point out, people think, they, they might say, well, okay, God loved him, but then why did he, he bring him to suffer all that and so forth? Christ got something out of his suffering, too just as God intends for us to get out of something out of the suffering. There, there is a reason for it. And look in Hebrews 2, 9. Okay. I'm I getting some serious paper cuts here. 
<laughs> Good. That means we're doing our job. If Where you are you at? <laughs> He's in Hebrews 2.9. Hebrews 2.9. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, let me start there. Now, we are observing Jesus, who has been made some bit inferior to messengers. Because of the suffering of death, wreathed with glory and honor. Okay, so that in the grace of God, he should be ta tasting death for the sake of everyone. For it became him because of whom all is and through him all is, in leading many sons into glory to perfect the inaugurator of their salvation through suffering. Well, that, that should encourage anybody who's suffering. The reason uh, God can return, Christ can return everyone to himself is because, and this comes back to what you were saying, Charlie, he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, is that all humanity was in Christ before it was in Adam. That's a critical point, isn't it? Everything came out of him, uh, Colossians 1, 16. He's the firstborn of every creature. I'm reading that in the 15th, 16th verse of Colossians chapter 1. He is the, Christ is the firstborn of every creature. All mankind was in him before it was in Adam. And that's important to know because now what, all, everything that, is, that has happened to us in Adam, which is not very good, cannot undo what went before. Now if we were in Adam first and Christ came on the scene to rescue, he might not get everybody. But everybody was in Christ first. So Adam, you know, since we're, we're it's after we came into Adam, then everybody's panicking. Oh my goodness, no, this, this sin, this evil, this death will never, will, nobody will ever get in Christ. But they started in Christ, you see. Explain they started that. there. Right. Explain that better. Explain that better. Oh, you're stretching me. I don't, well, I don't think anybody's ever heard that. Before. Okay, well, it's in uh, Colossians 1, 16, <laughs> every... He's the firstborn of every creature. That's, how about a couple different verses here? Oh, man, you're driving me I'm crazy. <laughs> a couple different <laughs> verses. Help me, guys. You got a couple different verses for that? Oh, All is of God. Me. How's that one? <laughs> All is out of him. We, we've been hammering Romans, that verse to uh, that, death. Romans 11. 36. Yeah, Romans 11.36. All is out of God. It doesn't say all is out of Adam. Okay, see, that's see what, what I need to see. See what I mean? Is, that, is that helping right, you? Yeah. It doesn't yeah. say all is out of Adam. If all is out of Adam, then God could come on the scene after that and try to rescue it. But all is out of God first. And this Adam business is happening only to reveal salvation. See, it's not an emergency situation. It's not 911. God didn't call 911 after Adam sinned in the garden. That was meant to happen. It was, it was purposed to happen. It had to happen. Or else Christ never would have come. People forget that. Christ never would have come if Adam hadn't hadn't come on the scene. But remember, we were in Christ first, then we're in Adam's. That's why there's no reason to panic here. There's no reason to panic that we're sinners, that we're failing, that, we're, that, that we are dying, because our position in Christ was secured before Adam came on the scene. He's a Johnny-come-lately. That's the radical thing about the verse Charlie brought up, that the lamb was slain, you know, that this salvation was in God's mind first. No, that's like... Uh we we was in First Corinthians fifteen, twenty two yesterday, and talking about all in as in Adam all are dying. Thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. Now that in there, in that verse is instrumental in. But if someone wants to say that that's positional in, what you just said, totally takes out that argument also. Good how. Because if they want to say it's only those in Christ, you've just proved all are in Christ. They were in Christ before they were ever in Adam. Well, wait a minute. I but just... we, we have to be real careful we don't say all are in Christ now. Because, yeah. not, you know, he hasn't revealed himself to everyone now. I know that. But we, you're going way, way back. You're going way, way back Did to you see just that go everything to... came out of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everything came out of Christ. We need to make sure we use the right terminology there. Because people will say, well, those guys are saying everybody's in Christ today. Everybody's in Christ. Well, well that, that isn't what I, what right. I meant, no. Right. I'm, but 
the positional, the way you put it too, mm -hmm. all is out of Christ. All was created in him. Yeah, that's true. I can't get away from that. Colossians okay, 1, 15 can, and 16. Let me just point something out here. Do you have King James? Yeah. Read it. Read Colossians 1, 16 in the King James. This is a live Bible study. That's why it's exciting. Mm -hmm. That's why. Hear those pages fluttering? Um, the reason why I say this is that if somebody was studying from the NASB, they would read, for by him all things were created. By him. That kind of shadows or hides the in him. Or maybe I'm splitting hairs here. Well, we, we need to split hairs. Every single word is important here. Yeah, there's a difference between in and by. Mm -hmm. In hey, sounds huge. more secure. Yeah, it, it, in the King James here, it has by two. But you know what? If you go down to verse 19, okay. there, there's one thing that they, they did put. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Okay, so so even if they tried to monkey around with the in, in him by him thing here we have a backup verse in the very text of this passage that clarifies it if we'd study it pretty close yeah ted what do the different versions read in verse 17 i think that's a big key as well my yeah. my oh, yeah. mine is yeah. reading uh all is uh created through him as well and for him and read the next one. And he is before all. Look. And all has its cohesion in him. So still, it, it is through Christ mm -hmm. that all is created. That everything came into being. Right. Everything. Right. And would it be, would it or would it not be a tragedy if the same all didn't return to him better for the experience? This is another thing people might get the wrong idea, right? We went, we're we hammering to death Romans 11.36. And you know what somebody actually said to me when I told them that everything comes out of God and everything returns to them? Well, God's just playing ping pong with himself. Hmm. You know, it's just coming back to him in the same uh, way that it left. But that is not true. You know, why, in the, if that's the case, then why did we have to go through all this turmoil, all this suffering? If he's just going to bring everything back the way it was, then that not that doesn't justify God starting this ball rolling in the first place. But when everything returns to him, it's going to be so much wiser and able to praise God. Why is there going to be hands lifting in praise when all mankind returns to God? Because of the ensuing evil. Because we have learned so much about God through this terrible process. See, we, we lean on him now. We, we long for him. We would never do that unless we had a lack of him. Mm -hmm. See, so he brings us through the lack and he brings us through the evil and he brings us through the turmoil to prime us to appreciate him for eternity. Now, Adam in the garden, he didn't appreciate God. He didn't I mean, he, he walked and talked with God all day, did not appreciate it because he didn't know what it was like to be without God. It is a blessing that God has taken us through this trial. And we're going to see that someday. It's exciting. It's exciting. And I know you haven't heard these things before. So stay tuned. You're going to be blessed beyond measure. The number is one 281 1110 You can call us anytime. Everything that needed to be accomplished in the way of salvation, the salvation of the world, the salvation of the universe, the taking away of the sins of the world, the making peace between God and his creation. Everything that needed done happened because of Jesus Christ's faith. And I gave you the analogy which, the more I think about it, this is a great analogy, that Jesus Christ's faith is the power. It's the energy. It's the thing that accomplishes everything. The analogy was a train. The engine of a train pulls the entire train. The cars that are hooked up to the engine, neither, 
none of them have their own power source. Our faith is a gift given to us to bring us to a realization of the truth. It's not the truth. It's not the trigger for the truth. It's that gift given us that makes us understand the truth that Jesus Christ is the engine. No car on a train is independently powered. And I told you this yesterday and I'm sticking with it. Our faith accomplishes nothing. Jesus Christ's faith is the engine. And when we become attached to that engine, we belong to the train, if you want to stay with that analogy, the train of blessings that comes through Jesus Christ's faith. And just for Jesus Christ to be said to have faith, this is a shocking thing. Because faith, according to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1, is an assurance concerning matters which are not being observed. How did Jesus Christ have faith? I'm going to elaborate on what I told you yesterday, that I'm going to go into these verses that speak of the faith of Christ. And I'll show you the deceitful way that these verses have been translated to forward the idea that the all-important thing in salvation is human faith. That is so wrong. Jesus Christ learned during his life that he was the Messiah of Israel. He learned that he was the appointed son, that he was the son of God, and that he was not only to be the Messiah of Israel, but the reconciler of the universe. He would be the bridge between humanity and God that makes peace, that causes God to look at humanity as a new humanity and not an old humanity that is dying under the sin of Adam. But as Jesus Christ grew up, he had to look at his circumstances. He was born the son of a carpenter. His parents were working class. They were probably considered ignoble in Israel. He had to look at his circumstances financially, his circumstances socially, and then he grows up and he goes into the temple. And he realizes that his truth is clashing with the mainstream. And you say, well, of course, he knew that would happen. I think it was a shock to him. The degree of the antagonism and the degree of the hatred. He saw them gnash their teeth at him. He felt their hatred. And he came to deliver them. So it took faith to believe that he really was what God appointed him to be because he did not see his glory. Remember, faith is an assurance of that which is not being observed. He was not observing, no matter which way he looked, to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south, in his own family, in his, quote, church life. He didn't observe anything of his glory. He didn't deserve anything of his rightful place. And then he goes to the cross. Then he suffers the most ignoble execution available to humanity, and that's crucifixion. And he knows what death is. Christians don't know what death is, but he knows what death is. And he knows that he is about to become obliterated. He is about to enter the realm of non-existence. Jesus Christ did not exist for three days. Did not exist. He knew what death was. And it shook him to his core because for certain on the cross, he was not observing anything of his glory, of his purpose to the point that he was almost shattered to the point that he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was at the end, the end of his 
holding it together the end of his faith. He was near the end of his faith. But we are saved not by the destruction of the faith of Christ, but by the faith of Christ. His faith endured even the cross. It was shaken. It was tested. But again, the essence of faith is not observing what you know to be true. And in his heart of hearts, in his spirit, he knew that he was the Messiah of Israel. He knew he was the Savior of the world. He knew he was the bringer of peace. He knew he was the bridge between God and humanity. And yet he was pinned naked to a Roman cross about to enter oblivion. That is the engine of everything. The faith of Jesus Christ. But listen to what has happened. Let me tell you what has happened. What has happened is that Christianity has said just the opposite. The title of my video yesterday, which I really like, was Our Faith Accomplishes Nothing. And it doesn't. Our faith, again, is a realization of what has been accomplished. Christianity says that our faith accomplishes everything. That it's our faith in Christ that saves us. And if that's true, it is true that they say that. Think of what that means. Think of the corollary here. The corollary is that Jesus Christ's faith, everything I just described to you, accomplished nothing. Jesus Christ's faith accomplished nothing. This is what they actually believe. They won't say it. But why is it that when you are born, your default setting is you're a sinner going to hell? Subsequent to Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. How could that possibly be? Because Jesus Christ's faith accomplished nothing. This is the practical result of Christian belief that faith is in Christ, your faith in Christ, is what gets you saved. I thought Jesus died for the salvation of the world. No, that is a whitewashed tomb. That is the presentation of the Christian religion, but it's a false presentation because behind it is what they really believe, what they can't say, is that the faith of Christ accomplished nothing. Okay, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Going to go through some verses here that talk about the faith of Christ. Let's start with verse 15, Galatians chapter 2. We who by nature are Jews and not sinners of the nations have perceived that a human is not being justified. Justified is being proclaimed righteous. A human is is not being justified by works of law. Except alone, alone, through the faith of Christ Jesus. Do you know that there are many translations that put faith in Christ Jesus? Couple that with the word alone. The NASB, New American Standard Bible, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ. Mistranslation. And there's not even a footnote there. Now let me show, if, couple that with the word alone. We believe in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by the faith of Christ and not by works of law. Let's go back to verse 15. We who by nature are Jews and not sinners of the nations, having perceived that a man is not being justified, a human is not being justified by works of law, except alone, reading from the concordant version, through the faith of Christ Jesus. Keep that word alone there and read the NASB translation in there. 
except alone. We're not being justified by works of law, but we are being justified by this alone. Faith in Christ Jesus. And it's the faith in Christ Jesus, according to the Christian religion, that justifies us and makes us righteous. Listen to the NIV now. So that we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ. This is the Bible. The NIV translation of the Bible that we may be justified by faith in Christ. I thought we were justified by the faith of Christ at the cross. No, not according to Christian teaching. This needs to be exposed. This needs to be stripped. This needs to be made naked. The emperor needs to be seen. We need to see the emperor as being naked, having no clothes. But listen what the NIV does. They put a footnote in the actual NIV version. And they hope you don't go here because this goes against Christian teaching. The footnote says, or through the faithfulness of Christ. And as I told you yesterday, what a profound difference between the faithfulness of Christ justified by the faithfulness of Christ. That's what the duplicitous NIV translators should have put in the text, justified by the faithfulness of Christ alone. But they say instead in the text, they were justified by faith in Christ alone. It's horribly consistent. Horribly consistent to say that it all depends on you. Horribly consistent. I will have to give them a little bit of credit for at least putting, the, putting it in the footnote. This is, the, this is Galatians 2.16. I'm about to read you from the Amplified Bible. There's also a footnote here, but the footnote does not correct the text. The correct text is the faith of Christ, not faith in Christ. What a difference a word makes. The NIV translation reads, typical Christian, your faith is the engine. Your faith is the most important thing. Here's how it reads. But they have a footnote here that opposes the very thing they claim in the text. Here's the text, Amplified Bible, Galatians 2.16. Yet we know that a man is not justified and placed in right standing with God by works of law, but only through faith in Christ Jesus. Only, it's only way you're justified, by putting your faith in Christ Jesus. And even we, as Jews, have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, there's the mistranslation again, and not by works of the law. By, observe, by observing the law, no one will ever be justified. That is declared free of the guilt of sin and its penalty. Here's the footnote. In the Amplified Bible, to Galatians 2.16, being justified is a legal or judicial declaration of righteousness. Justification has two parts. One, being declared free of blame, acquitted of sin, not guilty. Believers are justified because Jesus Christ personally assumed the guilt for our sin on the cross. That's true. Their footnote is freaking true. God declares the person righteous. Because why? Believers are justified because Jesus Christ personally assumed the guilt of our sin. That's why we're justified. And yet the text says, but only through faith in God's Son, Christ Jesus, are we justified. That we may be justified by faith in Christ. All right, my phone's in the sun, it's gonna burn up soon. The clouds never come in when I want them to, you know? I love the sun, but it's killing me here today. Tomorrow, I'm going to take you through all the verses in the Greek scriptures from the concordant version that talk about the faith of Christ. Most of these verses are 
misused. You know, the King James actually does get this right. That we might be justified by the faith of Christ. That's, that's how they handle Galatians 2.16. Yay for the King James Version. But even though King James only people, for instance, are reading that in the King James Version, there's the filter. There's the predisposition of the Christian belief that your faith is the all-important thing. But we know that it's not. We know that faith is a gift that gives us a realization. A realization of what? Of the truth. That everything was accomplished. That we need accomplished through Jesus Christ's faith. 